Okay. All right, we are thrilled that Carl, Carla Burns can join us today. She's a third generation member of the Church of the Holy Innocents in Highland Falls, where she has periodically served as warden. She has chaired our Diocesan Anti-Racism Committee for more than 10 years. She does a fabulous job with that. Has led the Province 2 Anti-Racism Network for a number of years and served as a member of the Executive Council Committee for Anti-Racism of the Episcopal Church. She is a teacher at heart. She worked in education for 47 years in college, high school, middle school, and elementary school, which is quite a record. She recently retired from the position of library media specialist at PS 154 in Central Harlem, where she still volunteers. We are blessed to have you with us, Carla, and blessings on your presentation. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I know we've all been thinking about current events and what's happening. And um, I think the big task for us is to how to make these connections in our own personal lives and actions. So that's what I want to talk a bit about today. Um, I think that I'll wait until after I speak to share my document Victor, okay. So current events have made me think about my own interaction with the police. And I have to preface that by saying, I'm a woman, I'm a black woman, I'm not a black man. So that qualifies it. I'm a member of the educated working class. Some people call that middle class, it isn't. <laughs> and I also drive a car, which three factors which significantly influence my interaction with the police. But I want to talk about four interactions that I had. I lived for 20 years in Brooklyn in Crown Heights, actually, and I taught in Crown Heights and East New York. I started out as a high school teacher and I was driving to work one day and I came to a stoplight. And there was a patrol car next to me stopped at the stoplight as well. And it got my attention because there seemed to be something splattering on the window of the back seat of the patrol car. And when I looked more closely, I saw that there was a black man handcuffed in the back of the car and that there was a police officer leaning over the front passenger seat and beating the heck out of this guy. And I was shocked and I was upset. And I can't remember if I was going to work or coming home, but when I got there, I called the precinct because I noted the precinct number on the side of the police car. And I called the precinct and I reported it. And at that time, I guess they had to take an incident report. They actually wrote something down and they said they would investigate it. I called back periodically and they always said, we're still investigating, we're still investigating. I don't, I was very naive. I should have gone to higher authorities, but I was new coming from Highland Falls. You know, I, I didn't know these things. I think you call your local precinct and something's gonna happen, but nothing happened. But one time I called, it was obvious that an African-American policeman answered the phone. And he said, well, we have two names here, but we're still investigating, I'll get back to you. I didn't hear from him. When I called back and asked for him, they said he had been transferred. And that was the end of that episode. I mean, they said, we're, you know, this has been going on a long time. We're still investigating. So I kind of threw up my hands and let it go. That's the first one. Second interaction that I had, I taught with an alternative high school in East New York. Um, for older kids who had been having problems in the regular school system. And so I was teaching in um, teaching a class. We were in a building that wasn't a traditional school building, but I was teaching and I looked up and I was looking at two patrolmen who had their guns trained on us in the classroom, in the space, because it wasn't a traditional classroom, in the space where I was teaching. And I said, what is this? You know, what's going on? 
And they said, uh, two people who robbed someone came into this building. And I said, well, this is the school and nobody's in here robbing anyone. But we did have a policy that during the break, which had just preceded my class, the class start, kids could go a few feet down to a corner store that was near the school, get a snack during the break and come back. And so I polled the kids to see who had gone to get a snack that day. Two kids had gone to get a snack that day. So I brought them to these, to the officers in the space that we, in the school, and um, they brought in this old lady and she just shook her head no, and they just left. So that was my second. My third um, interaction was my apartment was robbed. And I lived across the street from the Lubavitcher Hasidim. There was always a police presence there. There were always patrol cars, not policemen standing on that side of the street. So when I got upstairs and saw that I had been robbed, I went downstairs across the street and I said, I don't know if somebody's still in there. Will somebody come in with me into my apartment? They said, oh no, you're a different precinct across the street. We can't cross the street to help you out. And I said, come on, this is crazy. I'm just across the street. Well, this is pre-cell phone. So they called the precinct. The precinct didn't send anybody. Nobody was coming, nobody was coming. And so I said, come on guys, can't somebody just, just, just to say that there's nobody in the apartment. Well, there were two detectives for, I don't know why, they were coming out of the um, Lubavitcher headquarters. It was an older gentleman and a, and a younger man. And they said the same thing. I said, can somebody go in with me? They said, no, we're not allowed. So I just sucked my teeth and just turned on my heel and was heading for my apartment. But then the older, the older detective and the younger detective were coming across the street with me. And they came in and checked and luckily there was nobody there. But when the other officers from our precinct finally came, the detective seemed very uncomfortable because they were saying, who, who are you and what are you doing here? And he said, well, we're from the other precinct, but you know, um, nobody was coming, so we came in. But he looked very nervous. That was the third incident. The fourth incident was, I was, dry, I was coming back from work with my daughter in the back seat of the car, and we had made an arrangement with the Hasidim that we could park on both sides of Eastern Parkway. I don't know how you're familiar, as long as we lived in the block. And so they always had a patrol car parked across the Lubavitcher side and only letting Lubavitchers in. But we had made an arrangement with the precinct that as long as you could show ID showing that you lived on either side of the parkway, you could park there. So I asked, told the guy that he says, nah, get out of here, you can't park here. And I said, but we made this arrangement with the precinct. No, you can't park here. I went to the payphone, I called the precinct. They kept hanging up on me. I was livid. I got in the car with my daughter. I drove to the precinct. I went through the door and I could see the desk sergeant saying, yes, yeah, she keeps calling. She's on, uh, she's on the phone. And I said, no, she isn't. She's standing right here in front of you. The guy's eyes got big. Anyway, I went up and I was livid and I just went off. And um, all of a sudden the desk sergeant's eyes got big too. And I'm saying, what's going on? I turned around and looked. And all of the people who had been looking for some kind of police service for sitting in the precinct were standing behind me after they had heard my story. They were glaring at the desk sergeant too. So he sent me into the precinct captain. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, I'll call those people and tell them to let you park in the block. I went back and the guy said, nobody told me anything, you can't park here. But he got a police call where they had to go elsewhere and move their car. And I said, I am not moving until I get, because my car was in front of him. I am not moving until I can park in this block. And so he said, well, let me see your ID. I showed it to him. He threw it on the ground and said, go home. And I said, that's what I've been trying to do for the last hour. So those are my uh, four interactions, memorable interactions with the police, mostly in New York City and mostly in Brooklyn, New York, mostly in a black community. And 
I've been thinking about structural racism and my place in it. I teach and I taught for many years in the most segregated school system in the United States, New York City school system. So I'm a part of this, just as police are part of the police department. And I said, what can we do? What can we do? And I've been thinking more and more about the obligation we have to live with as a decent human being, as a faithful human being, if we're talking about our church, as a faithful human being, as a follower of Jesus in an inherently corrupt society. And I think about the two guys who reacted differently. The precinct officer who may have been transferred, may have gotten a promotion, or he may have been transferred because he gave me information that he wasn't supposed to give, telling me that there were two names that they had in that report. And I think about the white older detective who came across the parkway with me into my house. They are just two people in this huge system, just as we all are just individuals in this huge system. But it's really important for us to stop and think what is right to do here. And we can lose, we can lose from doing the right thing. But I found in my life that God is faithful if I am faithful. And I have never been punished in the long run. I'm still in the classroom. I retired from the classroom, but my life as an educator has been wonderful. And the reason that I'm still in the, I, I retired from the classroom, from the contact with kids is because of structural racism. And that's a whole nother story, which I'm not gonna tell here. But um, I've been thinking seriously about that, how each of us is really not easy. We can lose something from doing the right thing. But as followers of Jesus, we're called to do that. So that's what I wanted to say. I wanted to big up those two people in my life who did the right thing and try to use them as models that when these little instances that fly into our face unexpectedly and we're challenged to do the right thing, that we do the right thing. So basically, that's what I had to say. And um, I wanted to open the conversation, but I want to um, share a document with some ground rules that we will use. And I want to share an, a definition of an anti-racist. And then are there are a few discussion questions. So I'm going to share that now. Victor, is that OK? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So, um, not the discussion questions. Here we go. So we have our conversation ground rules. Uh, Stephen, just read those for us, can you? I don't want to have everybody to hear my voice constantly. Okay, sure. Uh, conversation ground rules, we are each responsible for ourselves. Our primary commitment is to learn and achieve understanding from our conversations with one another. We acknowledge that racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, classism, heterosexism, and other forms of oppression exist. What's heard here stays here. What's learned here leaves here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And um, we have a definition for anti-racist and that is taken from um, Ibram Kendi's book, which we're going to start reading. And uh, it is that an anti-racist is one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or, or expressing an anti-racist idea. And I have to say that Kendi's definitions have or um, are different from traditional anti-racism work definitions, and they're really excellent. But I like the idea that Kindy 
talks about, just doesn't talk about structural racism, institutional racism. He specifically talks about anti-racist policies. That makes it more manageable. You can change an anti-racist a, a, a policy. You can change a racist policy, but just saying that you're going to fight structural racism this is very overwhelming and, <laughs> and too abstract to um, deal with. So that's why I like Kindy's definition. And then we have our discussion questions here. Um, what has been your interaction with the police briefly? I tried to be brief too. I hope I was brief enough. And uh, what have you chosen to do to change racist systems? That's what we were talking about when we confront our everyday lives. And what would you like to see our diocese do in reaction to recent events? I just thought, since they're a group here, that's a good thing to get that information. <laughs> 